Proverbs chapter 6, if you would please. Proverbs chapter 6. I don't know whether I hear thunder or motorcycles going up the highway. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Let me just read that passage there. I think we've all heard it before. But the Lord is teaching us something and how to prepare for trials because it's something that, as Job said, a man is born to trouble. A person is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And that is so true. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways. Consider her ways. And be wise, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provides her food in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. That's a preparation. That's a preparation for the Okay, well, we'll just get along here as best we can. So the ant is preparing like we do for winter, and the ant does not wait till winter to do that. Uh, you prepare in advance. And so as a second part of our lesson here on trials, making sense of our trials, uh, I want to entitle this in preparing for our trials. And I want to say this, that trials do not take what is real joy away from us. They may steal a little peace at the moment when it happens, but they don't take away real joy. Uh, they will challenge our joy, and that's for sure. And they definitely are given the opportunity uh, through our trials to help us have defined for us where our joy comes from. And they can also cause our joy the opportunity in that time of testing to expand. I want to say that again. Trials help define where you're getting your joy, where you're getting your happiness from. Because trials were your things that you may have found happiness in, whether it's your work, your spouse, your friends, your job, your hobbies, your health, whatever it is. If something of that is taken away from you and me, a lot of times it's a test to say, well, I'm not happy because I don't have this. You see where I'm going with this. I'm not happy because I can't go there and do that. I'm not happy because of this. And Paul says, I have found whatever state therewith to be content. And he was in a, he was in confined to house arrest for two years in Rome as, as a, a political prisoner because of his faith in Christ. And he had shackles on him and he was, he was shackled to a guard 24 seven. One guard would go out and another guard would come in. For two years, when Paul went to the bathroom, a guard with shackles went with him. That's the way it had to be. If the guard let Paul escape, the guard would be killed. So the guard wasn't going to. And so, but the thing of it was, it was an opportunity for Paul <laughs> to preach to that guard any time within 24-7. I don't know about you, but that would have been a little bit hard for me. I don't care if it was Paul. I'm just saying. And you can say it too. You might not want to. But this guard was attached to him. And so here he was. When Paul wrote in Philippians, he said, I found whatsoever state I am there with to be content. And he wrote that from a prison cell with an amanuensis, a, a secretary as it were, writing these words down for him because he was given the ability and, and the right to have that. What I want to go on to say is that the New Testament Greek word for joy is kara, and it means to have delight, and it means to have gladness. And this word is very closely associated with the Greek word kairo, which means to rejoice. And so this is why our attitude during trials is so important. That's why our attitude during trials is so important. To learn to rejoice, to keep our attitude right. We are promised we will have tribulations in this life. Jesus said in John 16:33, He said, you will have tribulation. Jesus says, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace and the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And we need to grasp that positional truth and hang on to that. As for many of our trials, they should not come because we ignored the truth, but because we were faithful and the fallout from this world caught up with us. 
Again, a lot of the trials that we can ignore, we can get away with, a lot of trials that we won't have to suffer with, a lot of them can be averted because we're doing the right thing. So if we're having a lot of trials, it shouldn't be because we wouldn't listen to good information or good reason. I mean, good, sound, biblical reason. Even though we all have suffered because we didn't listen or we went ahead of the things of God, did our own thing sometimes, and didn't trust the God, trust the Lord. If we're having trials, it should be that it's because of our providential, undeserved suffering for the glory of God. Now, that kind of suffering which God uses to enhance our understanding of His presence in our lives, that's good suffering, and that brings rewards. So it bodes well for us to not bring undue trials and life upon ourselves by making bad decisions, especially if we know the Lord has good answers for us, okay? And here's where being faithful in the Word and in the church and in your Bible study during the week and mine as well, here is where the abiding Word of God activated by your or my faith in God minimizes a lot of the trials in this life. As Proverbs 133 says, we can avoid a lot of the trials in this life if we'll do that. We can't escape trials in life if, and I'll tell you why. There are three things I want to tell you is that for why we cannot escape trials in life. Number one is because there's sin in the world. You can't escape trials in life because there's sin in the world. Sin's going to bring trials upon us. Number two, there is the presence of the old sin nature in us. So the world provides the opportunity and inside of us, there's something that wants that opportunity. And number three, Satan is always trying to get the best of us. He's trying to seek to oppress us, okay? So we can't escape life's sorrows. Jesus, our Savior, didn't escape life's sorrow. So we're, we're not going to be able to escape them either. Job said a man is born to trouble as sure as the sparks fly upward, or as maybe it sounds like as sure as the lightning is bound to strike downward. I'm not sure this morning. But since Job says that we're born to trouble as the sparks fly upward, this is why we're called to think on things above, like Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4 teaches us. We're called to think on things above, not on things below. To set our mind or our affection on things above, where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. That's what that passage tells us. And where our life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's never remember that. That Jesus is the nest, if we were a bird, Jesus is the nest that we live in. And we're all in that one big nest of the body of Christ. The ark, if you want to call it that way. But I like to think of it sometimes that we're, we're sheep in the same pen. And Jesus is in there with us. He hasn't gone a wall. Or we're like birds and our Lord is the one providing for us. And we're all in that same nest together. And when that nest blows, Jesus is in there with that nest when it's blowing with us. Like the disciples in the ship on the Sea of Galilee. they were. Jesus was in there asleep in the corner. Well... That's all right. As long as you've got the captain of your salvation with you, you're going to be all right. Satan is the one that's always trying to get you to believe in God and trust God, okay? So the key to getting through trials lies in our thinking on heavenly directions. Thinking on heavenly directions. Our mental attitudes then need to align with the attitude and the thoughts of the Lord. The Lord says, I see you. I got you. I'm not going to let you go. Just trust me. We'll get through this. Okay? That's what He's saying to us. Our mental attitudes are important. It's important for us not to have a crusty, bitter mental attitude because it hurts nobody else but ourselves, and the Lord doesn't is not pleased with that. Our attitudes must be ready and they must be prepared in view of the trials that are going to come. As I said, we can't avoid them. And if they are, we'll not lose hope when the rug gets pulled out from under us. When we're in a catch-22, the question is, will we trust the Lord and receive the benefit from that? Or will we react and turn sour and turn angry and turn bitter and lose our faith? Maybe not our salvation, but we'll lose, certainly lose our faith. 
I want to bring out three benefits to our trials. And I'm going to give all three of them to you at first, so that in case I get blown away out here, at least you'll have them. The first one is, they give us a chance to see God working on our behalf. Our trials give us a chance to see God working on our behalf. It's not so much that we're showing our faith out, but God is showing His power in. He's demonstrating Himself to us. He does it for His glory. Again, the ant in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 teaches us to prepare for hard times by gathering her food before harvest time, before the cold barrenness of winter. And likewise, we're to prepare for tomorrow. And so that trial that we are going to have to face some way or another in our life, we can be assured that God will be seen in that darkness. He will be seen in that sadness. He will be seen bringing us through it, out of it. We will see Him if we just look. That second thing, and I want to, I'll go back to that, is that another benefit of our trials is that they offer us the unique opportunity to use what you know. Man, I, I you know, somebody gets their driver's license, they've, they've had uh, someone with them in the vehicle and they're training for however many months, and now they're going to start driving. Now they're on their own. They've got that driver's license. They've got, they've got a permit. Uh, to go out there, and it is a privilege, it is not a right, it is a privilege, and they've got that permit, and they go out there, and it's, now it's the time for me to test that knowledge that I had, stopping at the right signs, yielding at the right signs, knowing when to give the right away, knowing what to do here and there. I'm an opportunity to share that knowledge uh, with my driving skills. And there's other things too, but that's just an example. They give you the opportunity. Trials give us the opportunity to use what knowledge we have of God's Word to our situation. Lord, I'm going to trust you for this. I don't know how I'm going to be able to pay for that, but I'm going to trust you for this. Lord, I don't know if she's going to like me or he's going to like me. Lord, I don't know if things are going to work out the way I want them to for my business, but I'm going to trust you that I'm doing the right thing. Even though the boss may not be crazy about it, even though I might make more money if I you know, do this or do that or cut this corner or do that. But I'm going to trust you that you're going to make up the difference and even abound even more if I do things the right way. Another benefit of trials is that also while you are being tested and and for those trials and the testings that you go through, that you are using the, the Word of God in your solution, you're bringing glory to God. You're going to get rewarded for that. So, one of the great benefits of trials is they offer you opportunity to build up your eternal war chest, to build up your eternal rewards. Because God's going to remember that, and He's going to write it down, and it's going to be in that treasure trove of blessings at the judgment seat of Christ one day. So that's a benefit of trials that you might not get any other way. So those trials, they give you opportunity. We're not in some of the situations that the world is in. We haven't gone through some of the things that some Christians and other nations have gone through. And so the prosperity test that we're possibly, possibly going through or the poverty test we might be going through now is an opportunity to show God that, you know, I do care about others. I do uh, have the power of God working in my life. God is alive. And I am encouraged. And one of these things about the trial that we're going through with the COVID-19 testing and all the restrictions and, and the fear, and some, of, and some of it is legitimate, especially if you're a healthcare worker. Some of it is legitimate, especially if you've got some years on you and, and you're not the best of health. I mean, we're all going to die, but, you know, it's like we really don't want to know when. <laughs> I don't want to know when. And when you catch this disease, there's a good chance that this, this can be it. So I want to be ready to meet the Lord, but I'd rather not know when it's going to happen to me and thinking, well, I got it and I'm not going to get over it. A lot of people do, thank the Lord. It knocks the wind out of their sails, but they get through a lot of them do. But some of the trials that we go through are, uh, all the trials that we go through are for God's glory and for our good. So go back to the first one. We got to, before the, uh, the storm gets us, I think we'll be okay for a little bit here. Proverbs 6 teaches us regarding the ant who goes out and gathers her food uh, when the 
Harvesting time is, is ready. When the, when it's time to be taking it in, when you're able to get out to church, when you're able to read, when you're able to study, uh, when you've got the freedom to get the Word of God. Because if you wait until you've lost it, you won't be able to find the Word of God. That's in Romans, uh, Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. If you lose your freedom, you're not going to have the Word of God. It's going to be taken away from you. And me too. And so now you better gather the food before the storm comes, you know, for the hard time and the cold winter comes. We are to do this as sure as the pioneers of old gathered in wood and meat before the winter snow fell. Before we get snowed in with trials, we had all better fill the cupboard and the smokehouse of our souls with a stockpile of spiritual meat and food staples, food staples, remembering as our Lord said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. So you've got not just your house stocked and a little bit of cash in a sock somewhere. If you have it, I'd suggest putting it some a little something somewhere, even though it might not be much. It's a little something. Your security is not in the money. It's in the master. But the Lord does tell us to prepare. He does tell us to prepare. It's not going to just blindly fall in our lap. The Lord told in the... In the uh, Instincts of animals, the squirrels, everything out here. Squirrels are constantly out here. I'm sure they are in your area. If you're in an area that has a lot of these acorn trees, like we do these oak trees, they're squirreling away stuff, as they say. They're putting it away, hiding it, while the other squirrels are sitting in the tree watching them so they can steal it. There's a criminal element anywhere, everywhere, isn't there? But the Lord is telling us to squirrel stuff away, to store it away in the cupboard of our soul. And that includes the word of the Lord to give us direction and comfort to help us prevent from doing something awkward and stupid. I'm, I'm talking about not spiritually good. And then also to prevent us from being scared to death of things of which the Lord is going to see us through it. So if we do this now, take in the word while we have the opportunity, then when the time of testing comes, we will not succumb to fear. We'll start drawing upon the truth that is relevant to that situation. Because there will always be some huckster out there trying to misdirect you, thinking that they can take advantage of you when you're in distress. That's what Satan did to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 of his time in the wilderness, remember? The 40 days after Jesus' baptism and coming out of the Jordan River and he was put into his public ministry by God the Father who was well pleased with his son. And he went through his time of testing and time of deprivation as he was clearing his head, preparing for the ministry. One of the great things and I found about fasting, and I don't probably could do more of it, but when I go without a, at least a meal, especially in the morning, my thinking is a lot more clear than it is if I had eaten. And our Lord was very clear-headed and he was praying and he was fasting for 40 days. And Satan tried him, as you know, when it seemed like Jesus would have been vulnerable to, to just doing whatever it took to satisfy the flesh, and he wouldn't do it. And that's when a lot of times your trial of miles are going to come, is when uh, we've either had a victory or we're... At, and that's when you, most of the time your trials come, either when you're on the mountaintop or when you're down in the valley. And you're tempted to go into some quick... Re, re, a quick... Uh, answer to your problems when you're down in the valley or when you're on the mountaintop thinking that nothing can touch you. Those two extremes are where a lot of times our trials hit us. And God allows them to hit us to keep us humble, but He also allows them to hit us to help us with, see what lifts us back up too. And we can't avoid the mountains and the valleys of our life. We can't avoid it. And just be at peace with the fact that you do not have control over everything. I do not have control over everything. I don't have to because God is there with me. He's with you. He hasn't gone anywhere. There's not a time of uncertainty with God because He knew about this in eternity past. And since you are in God and God is in you through Christ Jesus, there's really nothing uncertain for you. God's got it all timed out. He knew in eternity past that in 2020 we'd be going through this in America. He knew you particularly would be going through this and He provided for you a provision in His grace and in His Word 
to get you through it. And he will. I know you know that. I know you know that. And I know that. We can help heap up a lot more rewards right now because in the age of this country, nothing this is way thing. We've had the Spanish flu, I know, 1918 or whatever they call it. But the truth of the matter is the churches weren't affected like they have been in this 2020 pandemic. This is this is unprecedented, but not to God. So it's an opportunity for us to heap up rewards, whereas had it not been for this pandemic, we wouldn't have gotten this opportunity. We wouldn't have been tempted to come out and sit in your cars in a parking lot and listen to a fellow behind a, a plastic wall preach to you, your brother in the Lord. So it does take a little extra effort. I know it does. A lot of things do for all of us. But it looks like you're succeeding. It looks like you're succeeding. If we stay with the Word, we will not succumb to fear and misdirection and somebody trying to take advantage of us. We'll be able to weather the storm safely inside the comfort of God's Word and the food of the God's Word that is stocked in our thoughts will be something that we can lean on and trust in and repeat. Get it back out and be sustained. That's why it says Ecclesiastes 12.1 Remember now the Creator in the days of your youth before the evil or old years come. When old age comes upon us and we have no pleasure in a lot of the things that we once had pleasure in. So if we should go through hard pressing trials it's not that we're always going to do so well at it. But we should not have to go far to find God's answers. It should be something that we have been preparing for, like a student in a school preparing for a test. The teacher tells you there's going to be something difficult on that test. Life has shown you that it could be just about anything, so you prepare the best you can. Trust God for the rest. That hard, pressing trial, again, will not be your last. And it will not be my last. Our attitude during the times of our trials is important for our Christian witness and our success. Not to mention our emotional stability and our mental mental sanity. Isaiah 33 and verse 6 tells us something. I, I just want to read it because I want to make sure we get it all right. Isaiah 33 and verse 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. And strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Again, Isaiah 33 and verse 6. I had this put on a bumper sticker that I made up a while back for the church. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. And strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. That's respect for God is a great treasure. The reason I think some pastors spend an awful lot of time in their time in their, their, their uh, studies counseling with a lot of folks is because so many people have so many things that happen to them in life that they are not prepared for. And certainly that is a part of counseling as a counseling ministry because no one is prepared for everything. But there are some people who are not prepared for the least of things. They're always waiting for someone else to do for them. And one of the great things about trials and testing is that you learn to do for yourself. You learn to become self-sufficient. And then God helps pick up. God doesn't have to pick up so much slack for you because you're a mature. A mature person prepares to be self-sufficient. And one of the great things that parents can do is help their kids learn to become Self-sufficient, not independent of their parents. That's not what self-sufficiency is. That you learn that if you only got $20 in your pocket, you don't promise somebody you can pay them 30 If you got $20 in your pocket, you don't promise to take somebody on a big date when you, or you're just going to Burger King because they'll eat up most of that. Don't go to Burger King anyway. Best thing they have at Burger King is that little paper crown out there. Never mind. <laughs> But you learn to think within your means. You learn to live within your means. And you learn to you learn to roll up your sleeves. You learn to work at something. You learn a different kind of trade. You learn how to 
sense what people are doing around you, somebody just trying to use you to get something for themselves. You learn yourself. All this stuff is important because this wisdom from the Bible teaches you and I these things. And that helps prevent you from having to ask a lot of the questions that some people still don't understand even as older people. If a person hasn't been saved very long, uh, they need some some a boost of counseling every once in a while. They need a little bit of help every once in a while. I get that. But if you've been a believer for years, that shouldn't happen. Unless it's something really trying. And we're always open to talk. Don't get me wrong. But giving people counsel from the Bible, from the pulpit, is God's primary channel for guiding His people through the trials of life before those trials happen. This is verified from the analogy given in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 with the ant preparing her food for the winter when the hard times come, when she can't get out there in the snow and get food. She's down there in that colony. She's down in there. She's got stuff squirreled away as the others do. And so they'll have meat for the winter, as they say, or food for the winter, for the hard times. And then back next year, they'll go out and they'll start gathering again. And we do the same thing, or you want to call it a spiritual root cellar. Better have one. Keep that thing at about 52 to 55 degrees. It's underground. Everything is good to go there. Watched the show last night, and it talked about people who were uh, homesteaders or something like that. And these people were not at all prepared for homesteading. They had, they had a homestead, but they weren't homesteaders. They didn't know how to be self-sufficient. They didn't know how to prepare and they were basically vulnerable to death within a month or two. Great idea about living off the grid, but the truth of the matter is they weren't prepared for it. And might not be a bad idea for you and I to think about if something should happen where we would be taken off the grid. That's always a possibility because there's the potential of attack on our grid, our electronic grid. So I'm just saying, it's good to have some sort of a backup plan. Just be wise about that. And some will need help, and some will be to the, the helper. But you don't, any of you, want to be totally helpless. So I'm just saying, something to think about. The ant prepared her for her provisions before the hard times come because she knew winter was coming. She knew hard times were going to come. I'm getting older. Some, all of us are getting older. Some are just seem like showing it a little more quickly than others. And we don't know exactly what the future has for us, but we know we're going to get older and we're going to get sicker. And we're going to need help on things like this. And so make provision as best you can. Some of you are still young, and of course you're invincible. It won't happen to you. No, 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 no. You'll be fine. But I'm telling you, spiritually there will be attacks on you, whether you're healthy or not. And that's something that we can be assured of. Even if, if Satan attacked the Son of God, you know he's going to attack you and me. Because we're weak compared to Jesus Christ. I pray that more Christians will understand this and that they'll stay in the Bible, stay in the Word, and stay in the things of God. And not get upset, get turned off because the Word of God is telling them something they don't want to hear. I understand that some people don't get the word anymore because for some reason in the past something bad happened and they've got a bone to pick with God. I'm going to tell you what, you can pick that bone with God all you want and it's not going to help you any. That's the old sin nature trying to take over your life and you don't want that to happen. Some people can get something stuck in their craw and they won't get over it. And so they won't get any more advice. They won't come back for more wisdom. They didn't get their way with a church meeting or this, that, or the other. And so they won't come back for the word of God. That's still stuck in their craw and they can't get the, the Word of God in because the Holy Spirit is still not in control of their life. We need the whole counsel of the Word of God, so we're here to try to give it. And you, and you know that. You can get evangelistic preaching every week and current events and prophecy and as uplifting and informative as they may be, but they're not enough to prepare you and I for the marathon of the Christian life for which it is. We need as much of the Word as we can to help us be prepared not only for our trials, but for after our trials. Because a lot of times after you and I have passed a trial, that is when we're susceptible to the devil's temptation. All right, I got through that, and then you need, because we need to take the time to reflect on how we got through that trial or that circumstance 
and see the blessing of God getting us through it. So we need to have all areas of life covered, and the Word of God covers all areas with scriptural teaching and preaching, because we are the subject to all areas. We are subject to all kinds of things happening to us. My wife is subject to something happening to her, or you are, I am. And we end up like we've had some members in this church who are still currently going through help, having to go weekly to have a medical treatments done because of underlying health conditions, because of other things. And we've had some that just recently come through cancer therapies and surgery. My Lord, how do you prepare for that? Well, you prepare by trusting the Lord uh, as best you can, and then after that, you learn to trust the Lord even more because we can learn from our trials. Not be all proud, and I don't need God anymore. In other words, it's like the tire blew out on my car. I'll jack it up, put the tire in the trunk on it. I'll take the old one and put it off, and I'll get it fixed sometime. And, and God is not to be thought of as just be. He will be used as a spare tire. God doesn't get upset if you use him for a spare tire, but he prefer that you kept him going all the time, that you trusted in him all the time, that it wasn't just someone you went back to when things went out of, off the rails, but he was the one that you trusted when things weren't off the rails because that's the time when you can actually be learning and are ready for the test when it came up. And again, you're reaping rewards down the road because of it. Don't forget about that part. The second I think, as I said, another benefit of trials in just a few more minutes is that they offer a unique opportunity to use the knowledge you have. You get to go out and you get to practice what God has shown you. And God likes to show off. You see the sunset. You see the beautiful flowers. Uh, I was watching a cat bird the other day. And I kept thinking, no, that's not a mockingbird. That's a cat bird. They tried to act like a mockingbird. They're a pretty bird. What do you get on birds for? I don't like birds. My wife says she likes birds. She married an old turkey. All right. But I, I that cat bird was carrying on it. It tries to act like a mockingbird, but it cannot mock like a mockingbird. But I think it's a prettier bird than a mockingbird. So it's practicing. It's practicing. It'll never be able to do what a mockingbird does. And a mockingbird will aggravate the living tar out of you, especially if there's one sitting out here during the preaching. I know that would be true. I don't want y'all to go throwing rocks or anything, if you would please at that time, if that should happen. But when you know something, it's a perfect opportunity to share it. And that bird's just trying to share what he knows. He doesn't know a whole lot, but he knows that, so he's sharing it. Well, that's to the glory of God. God made that bird to do that. God didn't make the, the cat bird to do the same song as the mockingbird, and the other birds have their tunes as well. God gives you an opportunity to use the knowledge that you have. And that helps you when you use that knowledge to build your trust in the Lord. And helps you to build your confidence in the plan of God for your life. And so you can go forward to the next trial and be even more confident. And it might be you that somebody who's weaker needs to help them get through their trial. We're all in this together, they keep saying. Well, there's a certain truth to that we are. There's a certain truth that we are in this together. But as Christians, we are in this together. We are in this fellowship boat. We're in this same boat together. And our, we, our enemy is a common enemy. And it's not any of us. It's powers and principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world. It's our self-doubt. It's a lot of these things that wants to forestall our spiritual maturity and spiritual growth and our joy of knowing the Lord. Paul said in Philippians 4, I've learned in whatever state I am there with to be content. I know how to be made low. I know how to have a lot. And everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And again, he was, he was shackled to a Roman guard at this time under house arrest. The first time he was in house arrest for two years. And he wrote these what is known as the prison epistles. But after he was released, and a few years later, not too much longer, he ended up going back to prison. But this time he was put down in a hole in the ground, and then eventually Nero had him decapitated. I wonder what tune he was singing there by himself. He didn't have Silas with him that time. He was by himself. He didn't have Silas with him during that other imprisonment. 
He did this <coughs> as on a different occasion. But in all these various trials in Paul's life, whether he was being shamed by his fellow Jews, or he was being imprisoned and isolated from fellow believers because of his faith in the Lord, he never tried to be a celebrity. He never tried uh, to excuse himself by any kind of bad behavior or anything else like that. He always called on the Lord to strengthen him through his circumstances. So we need to understand that. We need to have all areas of our life covered with scriptural teaching and preaching because we are subject to all areas of difficulties, as I said earlier. And so the benefit, the second benefit of our trial, it helps us to use what God has taught us. And then the last one is, is that you are building up eternal rewards. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Blessed is the, the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, this is testing and trial of personal temptations that we all go through, when you are tried, and that uh, dokimas, and then you have the word to uh, also for approval, uh, which is not a dokimas, here we have the approval, side of uh, testing you receive the crown of life and the crown of life is just a, a demonstration of greater blessings that will be followed and there's other passages that tell us the same thing about God rewarding us one day because we're faithful and our trials give us opportunity to show that faithfulness God says in Hebrews 11:6 that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him and so what you are rewarded with in times of trials not only is a heavenly reward, but you're also rewarded with a sense of the presence of God. And that's, I think that's what a lot of Christians are looking for, is that we'd like to sense that God is with us. We'd like to sense that you know we're doing the right thing, that He is there with us, He's agreeing with us, He's got our back, and... Uh, God, would, as it were, saying, I'm with him. I'm with her when you're out or when you're going through your trial. And with that sense of presence comes God's peace and his human, all that passes all human understanding. The rewards that you have may not automatically come immediately after you've been through a trial, but that sense of peace that you have and that sense of God's presence Get you through anything. The instinct to trust God does not come often at, at the time of your trials. It's developed prior to your trial. Developed prior to my trial. When you are faithfully and humbly submitting yourself to the communication of God's Word. It's just like a golfer that has all that, that, uh, that uh, memory, muscle memory. Synergetics, I think, something like that they call it. And you have muscle memory. You've made that that swing or that stroke with the putter so many times that you feel it in your mind and your mind feels it in your body and they're in sync. And you get out there and for every uh, 18 holes that a golfer plays in a round, a professional golfer has played thousands of rounds before he ever gets out there on that golf course, tens of thousands of rounds before he ever gets out there. And before he does that, He's been out there swinging that swing with the coach and he's been practicing and he's, be, he's developed muscle memory. He's developed physical, mental uh, instincts and they are memorized in his... He didn't even have to think. You can imagine how can they do something like that? He doesn't even have to think because he's done it so many times over and over. And when we take the Word of God and we apply it to our life, and we just keep practicing it over and over and over again as a regular statue of our life. When our trials come, we're going to just practice it as if that's not even a trial. Here we go. So what? It's a so what? I've got a stimulus check. So what? I didn't get a stimulus check. I, I'm sure it's coming, or I've already spent mine. Whatever. What's the difference? I'm not going to be a different person than I was before. I'm going to keep trusting. So I've got bad news from the doctor. I've got bad news from my boss. Good day here, B. Just hold on a second.
Well, oh, this a little demon flew up in here. Now, any other time I'd have a hat on. That's okay. God maybe trying to tell me to stop. I got bees after me now. Anyway, benefit of our trials. God helps you build up your eternal rewards. That's what's important. And as you build up those rewards by studying the Word of God, get out of here. Be still after me. One of the lack of benefits of being out here, hold on, people. That is a big bee. That's a dead bee, too. <laughs> All right, get back to it. I'm glad y'all don't have to put up what I'm putting up with. Hopefully, you don't anyway. You all right back there? Okay. <laughs> I thought my wife was going to attack the bee, and she didn't. She threw me under the bus. No, she didn't. But the instinct to trust God does not come at the time of the trial. It comes, it's developed before the trial happens. My instinct was to get rid of that bee before he got me. All right. So you want to have that confidence. And as that confidence builds up, you're being built up in the faith. All right. So, don't blame God if a trial comes to you, as I must not blame God if a trial comes to me. It's a part of life that came to our Savior. But God will see you and me through it. It will help propel our spiritual growth, help prepare us for greater rewards, strengthen us in our faith, and help us to be able to be a help to someone else down the road. There is a, there is a method behind the madness of trials. All right? Amen. So let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your many blessings and your, your wonderful care for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for seeing us through the little tests and the big ones as well. We thank you for Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago to provide for us eternal life and everlasting life. A life that begins the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. A life that gives us a sense of purpose and destiny that we did not have before. An assurance that we did not have before. Thank you for this, Heavenly Father. We ask now that you bless everyone that's come out today. Bless them in the truth. Bless them in, in uh, their lives. Help them as I to prepare for the things of life that we can prepare for. And then to just trust you for everything uh, that you call upon us to trust you for. Use us for your glory. Strengthen us in ways that we are weak. Keep us humble in the ways that we are proud. And Father, if there's anyone that does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, before it is eternally too late, we pray, Father, that that person will say, yes, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I now accept him as my Savior. I know that Jesus rose from the dead, that he ascended into the heavens and he's interceding for me. And I need him in my heart, in my life. I need forgiveness of sins. And I ask Jesus to come in and take over my life and to save me. If Father, we realize that if anybody prays that prayer, that God will save them for all eternity. He'll write the name down in the Lamb's Book of Life and it will not be removed. And then God's Spirit will come in. Praise the Lord and give instruction and give guidance and give peace to those that receive Jesus Christ as eternal Lord and Savior. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and we give you thanks. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.